All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, on behalf of Mayor Neil Andrews and all of my colleagues on the Ventura City Council, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, the, the healing process starts today. Uh, just this morning, the governor took a driving tour of the devastated areas. Our Congress people have toured the devastated areas. Um, I think we all know uh, what this week's been like for many of our neighbors and many of our friends. You know, our city really is facing its darkest hour. This is the, the worst natural disaster in our city's storied 151 year history. And I think many of you know Ventura is my hometown. And, and like many of you, I'm just truly heartbroken at, at the devastation I've seen. Uh, but they, they say in, in, the, in the darkest hours, once true character emerges. And I think that principle holds true for communities as well. What are, what are we as Venturans made up of? What is our character as a community? And here's what I know. In this past week, I have heard countless stories of neighbors helping neighbors, of strangers helping strangers, the donations to our nonprofits and our churches are overflowing. Just last night, I've heard three stories at, at different restaurants downtown. Um, some of you may not know, but there's close to 4,000 first responders currently battling the fire in our community right now. Thank you very much. And so you'll appreciate this. Last night, in three different restaurants, teams of first responders walked into restaurants just to eat their dinner after a long day in the field. And in all three restaurants, they were greeted with a round of a standing ovation. And, you know, that's the Ventura I know. And that's the Ventura I love, and that's the Ventura we are. You know, we're, gonna, we're going to get through this. This is, this is a, a hard time right now, but we're going to get through this, and we're going to get through it together. You know, hand in hand, we are going to rebuild our beloved Ventura together. And so let's start that process today. I'd like to introduce uh, as the next speaker, our supervisor for the first district, Steve Bennett. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, I just, for those of you that are out there that have suffered a loss of, of your home of any kind, uh, I just want to offer my personal condolences. Uh, on my street alone, uh, we have seven homes that uh, we've lost, seven families that we're close to. Uh, and I know ver everybody in this room is being touched by many people that are going through that. Uh, and so I'm sorry uh, that we're in this situation. And just as Matt said, uh, the remarkable thing is it, to watch our, our community, our neighborhoods rally for each other right now. And I'm truly humbled as I watch everybody step up. and the, the, the beauty of, of everybody is just showing through in their generosity and, and everything else. From the standpoint of this being a meeting about recovery, I want to assure everybody that we've already had joint meetings between the city and the county to try to coordinate everything that we possibly can in terms of the recovery effort. And you're going to hear from some of the experts uh, after Matt and I are finished. Uh, and we will continue to try to fight to find answers for you as quickly as we can. Uh, really appreciate everybody's patience and understanding in that when you bring in 4,000 firefighters, when you um, have a fast-moving emergency like this, not everything can get done perfectly but everybody is committed from the top to the bottom to try to make this happen. So we have what's called unified command out there, and that is where CAL FIRE uh, comes in, and they come in in all of these situations as soon as it expands beyond the city's limits. 
Um, and uh, CAL FIRE is here to coordinate um, uh, the big response. And we at the city and the county level are going to try to work really hard to coordinate um, the recovery response. And so in the other room, you're going to have uh, lots of experts there to be able to answer many of your questions about recovery, what to do. Um, we will have on this program Dr. Levin to talk to you about the importance of being careful with all of the hazardous ash and everything else that is at these burn sites. Uh, we have other experts that will try to give you the best information. The final thing that I would like to say, I appreciate the city organizing this meeting, including the county, including me uh, in this program. And I want to let you know if you have any questions that we can help you at from the county level, please call my office, email my office. We will bend over backwards to try to get you the information as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mark Watkins, city manager, city of Ventura. Thank you all for being here. And for the folks behind me, I want to start also with my thanks to all of the crews literally from across the state, from across the western United States. If you've been out, there are fire trucks here from literally all over the place. And the number of the response and the number of resources we have available to us is incredible. Uh, this indeed is a tragic event. I was going to just recap it very quickly, then we're going to get you uh, to hear folks. But uh, we had a city council meeting on Monday night, normal day like it was for all the rest of you. We start at 6 o'clock, about 6.50. I received my first text that there was a fire in Santa Paula, uh, and they described it as a dangerous fire, and the winds were picking up. Uh, got a text about 7.30 that it was growing. Uh, by a little after 9 o'clock, we were starting to evacuate on Delondo by 10.05. Less, almost, right about three hours later, we declared a state of local emergency. That's how fast moving it was. That's what was there. Um, immediately, everybody has shifted into a 24-7 operating mode. Um, trying to get Ventura back to where we need to be, and that is our goal, is to get our community back to where it was at 6 o'clock on Monday. And we're working very hard to do that. That being said, I'm also going to be asking for your patience, because this is still an active fire. This is still an active burn. Uh, we had a number of events just last night within the city of Ventura. The fire chief can go through those, but this fire is not done yet. And so until the fire itself completely ramps down, recovery does not completely ramp up. We're doing both. And so we'll be asking your patience as we get there. We're absolutely determined to get there, and we will. I also want to say we don't have all the answers, but we did not want to wait any longer before we came to you and told you what we know. And that's the goal of today, is to give you a complete briefing and to give you everything we've got today. Um, we'll have everybody here from public safety to public health. All of these people will be, be available afterwards with many, many others in the cafeteria to answer all of your direct questions as to tell you what we know today. And then by the end of this week, our intention is to have what we're going to call local assistance centers set up. Uh, and we will have this type of, a, of, of resources available to you five days a week. And we will keep that open as long as it's needed and until we can get uh, the resources to everybody that are needed. And so with that, I'm going to start uh, by introducing our fire chief, uh, David and Daya, And he will introduce the others from the fire, give you operational where we are and uh, what the situation is now. So Chief and Daya. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Um, this past week, goes without saying, has been the most difficult week of my career uh, in the fire service. I've been your fire chief for about four years now, but I've been serving this community since 1993 uh, from the rank of rookie firefighter. So I haven't been a transplant. I haven't come over here from another department. This has been my community as a firefighter and a paramedic since the early 90s. And watching our community go through what it went through on Monday night, um, still at this point, is very difficult for me to talk about and to see. Um, so I sit with you and I stand with you and the people behind me uh, to watch this community come back uh, to what we were, both with your firefighters, your public servants, your city, uh, and the community as a whole, the county, uh, to do this. We've been working feverishly. Uh, I've been at our emergency operations center since Monday night. Uh, working on this uh, to try and work for you because that's our charge. On Monday night when I first saw this fire, I knew immediately that it had the potential uh, to, be, to be the career fire, to be the fire that we never wanted to see. And within about 45 minutes, I knew that's what we had. I want to take the time, as I've done in a few press conferences, to thank you. Um, there are many communities where, where the community didn't heed warnings, 
they didn't listen to their first responders, they didn't listen to the law enforcement officers coming through, and it became an, it, it impeded our progress or our efforts to save lives. And we, the fire may have taken property, um, but we saved lives, you saved lives. This community rallied together and we got 27,000 people out of our hillside communities in less than an hour, and that's because you cooperated. I've honestly never held my breath for four days on remaining that we have unfortunately suffered a fatality that was related to a vehicle accident near Wheeler Canyon and Foothill Road. But there's one number that I, I am holding on to hope every day that we keep, and that's zero fatalities related to this fire. And that's because of you and the people behind me. This fire came through at rates that we have never seen before. We are a city fire department of six fire stations, and those six fire stations staffed daily have a total of 22 firefighters protecting this city. Now we have 4,000 Ventura City firefighters in my mind, and they're here to protect you and to get this community back on its feet. They launched out that night, obviously every firefighter we had on duty, we called back the entire fire department and if we owned a vehicle with a lug nut or a tire on it, it was staffed and launched out to fight this fire and to do everything it could to save lives and do the best it could to get to the properties as well. Um, I think you, with watching the news, there's no new information I will give you as far as what this fire did. Um, I got most of my view from, from the media as well because we were in the emergency operations center with the rest of your city departments trying to keep the city up and running the best we could in such a devastating time. What I will do now is introduce to you members of the CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 4 staff. These are the people who are embedded right now at the Ventura County Fairgrounds and they're, they're managing this incident from the Fillmore area up to the Carpinteria area all the way up going into Santa Barbara. They'll give you some statistics, but what I'd like to do is make something clear. This team does not come in to take over this incident. This team comes in to either stand shoulder to shoulder with me, with Police Chief Ken Corney and the city, or a little bit behind us. They're here for us. They are here to, re to get you back to your neighborhoods they are here to make sure this community gets back on its feet before they leave. They are not only here to fight this fire. Part of their plan is making sure while part of their team manages the fire front, the rest of this team is here today for you to make sure that what the fire has done is also addressed. So they are not leaving when this fire is out. They are leaving when the communities are starting their journey to get back on their feet and be Ventura strong once again. I am extremely proud of your firefighters and the actions they took that night, and I could not be more proud of the fire family that is California and the Western United States. So with that, I will turn this over for some incident data and some actual updates on what's currently happening out there to Unified Incident Commander from Cal Fire, Steve Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying I've done community meetings all over the western United States on large fires for many years and I can count on two fingers how many times we've had a turnout like this, so thank you very much. <laughs> my name is Stephen Beach, I'm a division chief for CAL FIRE. My home unit is in Riverside, that is where I work and that is where I live. Um, I am one of the unified incident commanders for CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 4. We are one of six type one incident management teams in the state of California that are called to manage the most devastating, the most complex types of incidents from fires to floods that California experiences. As you're well aware, in October, we had a very tragic incident that occurred in the Napa, Sonoma area. We had four teams active during that, that fire siege in October. Currently, we have five teams in the state of California active on very various fires. So um, we are here, as Chief Anaya said, to uh, prop up our partners, um, our partners in Ventura County and Ventura City, 
um, called us because they had exceeded their abilities to not only fight the fire, but stay engaged in their day-to-day -day jobs, protecting everything that goes on in the city while there's a fire going on, because life does not stop. So we're honored to come in and do that. Um, we entered into a commingled unified command with our federal partners yesterday. So uh, United States Forest Service, California Interagency Team 4, we're both Team 4, integrated with us yesterday. So you have two Type 1 incident management teams on this incident. That is a rare honor. So you, you've, got, you've got some expertise from all over the country dealing with this incident. I'd like to take a minute to give you a little bit of an update on, on the current situation. As you drove in here today, you saw smoke in the sky. This fire is nowhere near over. It has just moved into another area, and now we're focused on the west side of this, more toward the Santa Barbara front. Currently, the fire sits at 148,000 acres. Okay, and it's going to get a lot bigger before it's over with. Um, we are at 15% containment as of this morning. That number changes constantly, and we're, and we're working and striving toward slowly inching that containment numbers up every day. Um, as you've heard a couple times, we have 4,000 people on this incident, and that's 4,000 firefighters, not just from Southern California, not just from California. I stood in a briefing line today and spoke with one of my brothers from Portland, Oregon. We have people from Nevada. We have firefighters from Arizona. So those 4,000 firefighters are from all over the Western United States. Early on when this siege developed, our, our management command and control staff in Sacramento placed an order through what we call the Interstate Compact Agreement for 200 out-of-state fire engines to come into California. And this is what you got. It's pretty, pretty darn incredible. <clears throat> So with that, some sobering news. Um, you have been hearing a constantly changing number of structures damaged and lost. That's a natural development of occurrence as we get in there and evaluate what's going on in the areas that had fire. Currently, and these numbers will change daily for the next week or so, but currently our tally is on the entire incident, a total of 537 structures destroyed. Now, that is a combination of residences and outbuildings, and in the several weeks to come, we're going to more define what that number looks like. That number may not mean 537 occupancies, but, we, but that is a sobering number. And then in addition to that, there were 118 structures that have been uh, damaged to various degrees. And with that, the cost of fighting a fire this large is staggering uh, to date. The cost of suppression on this fire is $17.4 million, and it is going to go up. Part of that <clears throat> is what we do, uh, and our aircraft costs are very large. The support costs, we have a, an incident base set up at the fairgrounds that is supporting 4,000 firefighters. It is a small city. We have to feed them. We have to sleep them, shower them, provide them um, logistical support and everything that they need to go out and do their daily job. So it's a big operation. During the course of the incident, and, and this has been an ebb and flow number, we have ordered evacuations at various periods of time totaling 88,000 residents. Now that is not a current number, that is a total number. And, and, and I'll close with this. When my fire service brothers and I order an evacuation, we are homeowners, we don't take it lightly. So when we say it's time to go, your cooperation has been and is greatly appreciated. And conversely, when it's time to repopulate a devastated neighborhood, we do not take that lightly either. We have to make sure that the infrastructure is intact, that it is safe for you to go back in there, and there is a whole lot of process going on to make sure that it's safe for you before you go back into your neighborhood so that we can hang our hat on it and say, you're safe to go home. We do not want anything to happen to you if we open it up too early. So I'm going to turn it over to our operations section chief uh, from Ventura County Fire Department, and Chad is going to give you just a real quick overview of the operational picture of the incident. This is very, very sobering. 
On behalf of Ventura County Fire Department, I want to thank you guys for everyone showing up here today. And as an operations section chief with the county, we are embedded with CAL FIRE and the Ventura City Fire Department from day one on this incident. And I just want to express to you what's going on actively on the incident. I'm going to move this microphone around so I can talk to the board. If you look at the top portion of the fire, we'll call that the north portion of the fire. I'm going to move back and forth between the map. I think it will help better describe the current conditions on the fire. Okay, on the top portion of the fire, you'll see the north. You'll see we basically zoned the fire into three zones. We have a Ventura zone, and we have a Santa Barbara zone, and basically a national forest zone, although embedded into the Ventura area. What's happened here is the north side of the fire continues to progress. That's the piece of line that is going up into the national forest. Currently, it is up in the Highway 33 Rose Valley area, which is a very long, long way from here if you think of where that fire actually started. That's the north section of the fire. If you move around to the east section of the fire, the east section of the fire sits just above the Good Enough Road area, above the area of Fillmore. So it has progressed all the way almost to the city of Fillmore. That area up in there continues to move up into the Bear Haven area of the Los Padres National Forest where it looks down into the Sesapee drainage. Perfect, thank you. Down here along the bottom portion into the Santa Paula area, it moves down across the 126 corridor. There are many places where this fire has come all the way down into the city of Santa Paula in the 150 corridor and down in and around the city proper of Santa Paula. If you take the actual incident and you move it down along the bottom, you'll actually see where it um, comes along Foothill Road and along Foothill Road, it progresses all the way down into the Ventura city limits. All of that area currently is in a patrol status where we have had multiple companies working in there and we are continuing to patrol hotspots. When you see the area that has red around the map and black around the map, black is contained fire line, red is still open fire line on this map. As we move down around the city of Ventura, you'll see some black around there. We continue with resources in and around the structures because we are still getting fires that are popping up from all the ember shower and ember cast that we had throughout the city and fires continue to surface. Resources will stay diligent in that area and very diligent as far as what's going on down around the city because that still continues to be a threat. As you move around the city of Ventura and up through the Highway 33 corridor, as you are aware, the fire jumped Highway 33 and was established on our oil lease properties that run north and west of Ventura. It continued all the way along the coastal routes, from the coastal routes almost to the county line up to Bates Road. Currently, the fire sits just above Bates Road and the Carpinteria Highway 150 area, where it's about four miles from touching that right now as a crow flies into the National Forest. As you move along that 150 corridor, it has not crossed the 150 on the south side, but it is outflanking us right now and coming down towards the 150 from the forest, where it's pushing our hands up against the Santa Barbara County line currently. As you can tell by me discussing this and painting this picture, this is a massive fire. Our operations right now are to continue to hold what we have, continue with our structure protection in and around houses, and look for opportunities where we are building contingency lines and primary containment lines to bring resolve to the incident. Thank you. Right, good afternoon, I'm Rich Thompson, and I'm the incident meteorologist with the National Weather Service. When a fire grows this big and they call up an incident management team to control the, to manage the fire, usually those teams are, get assigned an incident meteorologist. And as incident meteorologist, I'm there on the site to give them weather support, whether it be through briefings, forecasts, community meetings, media interviews, things like that. So I'm there on site at the fairgrounds as their weather source uh, for fighting this fire. And the reason I'm there is because weather has a great impact upon fire and fire behavior, and therefore firefighter safety. When this fire first took off Monday night, the area was under a strong Santa Ana wind event. We had wind gusts reported anywhere from 60 to 80 miles per hour across parts of Ventura County. And so with those winds, this fire was able to spread very, very quickly, as you saw Monday night and Tuesday morning. Now, uh, for forecast-wise, what I'm expecting in the next few days, uh, currently Ventura County is still under a red flag warning until 8 p.m. tomorrow evening. And what that means, we're still expecting widespread critical fire weather conditions across Ventura County that can lead to rapid and extreme fire spread. Uh, so we're expecting a combination of some really get, some northeast winds and some very dry conditions. For the fire proper, we're expecting generally uh, tonight and tomorrow morning, uh, northeast winds gusting anywhere from 20 to 30 miles per hour for the most part. 
Along with that, relative humidities are going to be very dry. We're looking at relative humidities in the single digits, like 5 to 10 percent. That combination leads to critical fire weather conditions and can really uh, pr produce conditions that can allow this fire to grow. So we're definitely watching the forecast, and I'm updating the forecast as we go along. Uh, for most of next week, those Santa Ana winds are going to start decreasing. We're going to be kind of just kind of a weak northeast winds at night, and then kind of an onshore southwest wind in the afternoon. But things are sort of remain very warm and dry. So all the way through next week, there's going to be the potential uh, for elevated or even critical fire weather conditions to continue across Ventura County. Then, unfortunately, by next weekend, looks like there is potential for another Santa Ana wind event to develop. It's still kind of questionable at this point in time with our computer models, but. It's the potential is there for another Santa Ana wind event to develop. So I'll be watching that closely and sharing that information with the firefighters in order for them to, you know, uh, correct, properly manage this fire. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Chavez, and I serve as the fire behavior analyst on uh, Cal Fire Incident Management Team 4. My job is to analyze the fire's uh, activity and use that information to assist in planning operations and safety for firefighters and the public. Uh, when I was a young firefighter, we used to jest amongst ourselves that California, Southern California in particular, had a 13-month fire season. Uh, it's not true every year, but uh, this year we're definitely going to fill that criteria out. Uh, Right now, we're sitting in this area at 245 days since there's been a tenth of an inch of rain or more. So what, that hap what, what happens is, is we typically get offshore Santa Ana wind events uh, in the fall, starting in September. They increase in October, November, December, and actually the peak month for our occurrence of Santa Ana is January, and then they kind of decrease February, March, and April. And then we have summer. So the typical summer fire season runs in Southern California from April till October. Well, generally late October, first part of November, we get our first small shot of rain. We get a little bit of rain here, a little bit of rain there. The green grass sprouts up and the ignition hazard is over. Well, that did not happen this year. And it, it's, not, it's unusual, but it's not unprecedented that that happens. Uh, if you can think back, 1996, 2003, 2007, 2008, we had a similar situation, but uh, we're stretched out a long ways from the last rain now, and then when we have a strong wind event and we have an ignition, uh, this is what happens. The fire burned 14 miles the first night. Um, that's pretty uh, spectacular fire spread for one night. Um, yesterday, I think the fire burned 10,000 acres, and we were pretty happy about that. Uh, so that's the kind of situation we're in. We're at the far end of the spectrum as far as fire behavior goes, and we have a long week ahead of us, and we thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our police chief, Ken Corney, talk a bit about the uh, mandatory evacuation areas. And, uh, and other issues from the public safety end. Ken. Good afternoon. I want to give you a little perspective from the policing uh, uh, actions that took place. We were, uh, when this fire began to break out, we had a little more than a dozen police officers working throughout the city of Ventura. We were made aware that the fire was moving very fast. We were able to work with the Emergency Operations Center of the county to get out of the Ventura County Alert program, which many of you received phone calls. And those of you who aren't signed up for Ventura County Alert, understand it's an opt-in program, and I urge you today to go home and make sure you're signed up for the future. Um, we sent officers into the hillside. At the same time, we were calling officers in. We had the assistance of the Sheriff's Department. And I'm very proud, I stand here before you as, as one person of the uh, representative of the Ventura Police Department, but we have 134 members of our crime fighting team, sworn officers, and over 50 members of, uh, of our professional staff who helped out, and we got into the neighborhoods, and they were banging on doors, and probably many of you saw them, and, and running up and down the streets with PAs and sirens and, and alerting everybody. And then we had the cooperation of, our, of many of our community members and helping to alert other members in, organ, and in an orderly fashion get out of those neighborhoods, and that's why we don't have any deaths yet, and hopefully that'll hold. Thank you.
So moving forward, how we're deployed, we have, uh, obviously we still have a patrol force that needs to be out there. We've had uh, shootings and stabbings and sex crimes and robberies still going on in our city that our patrol force needs to be out there to, to, uh, to respond to and investigate. In addition, we have officers assigned to the focus areas of the hillsides, especially those under mandatory evacuation. Where we're able to set up the hard closures or road barricades. We're able to um, um, patrol the areas for potential for looting, and I'll, and I'll address that in a moment, and other uh, significant hazards in the, in the area. I have been very fortunate to be working uh, with our sheriff each day and uh, working in the mutual aid process for, for policing. Uh, we've had assistance from a number of organizations, the Oxnard Police Department, the Ventura County Sheriff, even some non-traditional uh, 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 law enforcement partners. Ventura County Probation has uh, deployed uh, well over 20, 25 officers, uh, their officers to help us. Uh, the California Highway Patrol and our district attorney investigators have, uh, have been out with us and it's been critical. Although, as well as that has been working, we've been running out of resources. And uh, we're very fortunate to have the California National Guard, Colonel Rob P Paoletti here, uh, who have responded to us. I, I, I was blessed to have an existing uh, relationship with the Colonel, and we spoke early on in the process, and uh, he has been just outstanding in, in making this happen, cutting through the red tape, and that's why they're deployed right here, and it's the military police, and they're here today. You can meet them. They're going to do a fantastic job for us. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Looting. Residential burglaries thefts from vehicles, vehicle burglaries in the areas. We've had little more than a dozen reported so far. We do expect that number to go up as people begin to, to visit their homes and go into the area. We do have routine patrols going through the neighborhoods in the evening. We have hard barricades, you know, hard closures at the, um, at the uh, evacuation areas doing our best to prevent it. We know people are walking in, people are some criminal elements are hiking in through orchards and back hills and things. Um, we will continue to be very diligent. Please, if you're in those areas and you see suspicious activity or you know something, please call 911 and report it. We, uh, we're hoping that it's a, it's a few criminals doing this and we can get them in custody and, and put an end to it quickly. Uh, finally, um, from a perspective of seeing what's, what's the devastation in this town, my 31 years with the police department, I never expected it to be, quite honestly, as complicated as it's going to be. Uh, I have been in the neighborhoods on a regular basis uh, and seen what we're going through, and I, I completely understand people wanting to get into their homes and need to pick things up, but there, are, uh, there is utility work going on, there is some major problems in all those neighborhoods, and it's just completely unsafe to let people go in freely. We started today, as many of you know, and we'll be doing it tomorrow too, escorting people to their homes. We have the assistance of probation, the National Guard, Ventura police officers in, in doing that, and uh, we're doing it out of the Temple Beth Torah is the staging area, and we're taking people up. I encourage you, we're doing it today till 4 and tomorrow from 9 to 4 too, and we'll see what the future holds. But be patient, understand that it is very complicated uh, to get people back into the area, and it's going to be some time uh, in the most devastated areas, and, and we, uh, we appreciate your support and, uh, and understanding. We have uh, lifted the uh, curfew to only include those evacuation areas between Day Road and Foothill. We had a citywide curfew, I think most people know, from 10 at night till, um, till 5 in the morning. We have now changed it to, obviously, in the evacuation areas, a 24-7 curfew. It gives us the ability to deal with some of, uh, some of the potential problems that might exist there. So I ask you to, to please assist us in honoring that curfew. Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Uh, next up, we have Kevin Brown. Kevin is the general manager of Ventura Water. Talk a bit about the, uh, how our water system responded to the fire and also the current status of boil orders and water quality. So, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the fire system and the boil order uh, during the fire event in our water system and wastewater system. During the event, uh, prior to the event, our water system was in normal operations. When the event started, I'm going to move these over. When the event started, we recalled all water and wastewater crews. First thing we noticed was an unpre unprecedented draining of our water tanks. Uh, we got word of low pressure areas. Our crews responded. 
the electrical grid dropped off, and our crews were racing around the city trying to place generator power on pumps. Our crews were in harm's way in the fire line trying to boost pressure within the city. We also had some damage to some of our um, fire, uh, some of our water infrastructure up on the hillside. Crews have been working around the clock to try to restore all service. Water and wastewater systems are currently fully operational and responsive. There is no problems right now with the water system. But as a result of the fire event, the low pressure we experienced on the hillside caused us to institute a boil water advisory there first. And then, given the amount of water we had to take into the city system, we had to bring in water that was filtered, yet not disinfected. Therefore, we instituted, for health, for health safety purposes, with the state of California uh, Department of Drinking Water, a boil advisory for the city. We have been successful in lifting the boil advisory for the majority of the city, except for the area east of Cedar, north of Poli, and north of Foothill. We continue to test the water in those regions and working with State Department of Drinking Water to eventually release those areas from a boil advisory as soon as we get the clearance from the state. At no time, and I want to emphasize, we tested the water the entire time this was going on. We tested the water the, the morning after the event, the morning, during the event, and have continued to test the water as we do on a constant basis, and we have conducted additional tests for harmful contaminants. At no time have we detected any harmful contaminants in the water system. And I want to I want to thank you all for being here and if you have any questions regarding your water, wastewater system, billing, those things, we have a table set up in the um, uh, auditorium area uh, for you guys to come and ask us questions and I'll be there also. So, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Levin. Uh, Dr. Levin is our public health officer. He's going to talk a bit about air quality and some of the health consequences uh, associated with this fire. Dr. Levin. Good afternoon. Um, as I was driving here, my wife asked me how many people would show up. In my vast wisdom of doing this for 20 years, I told her eight people would come. <laughs> there are about a thousand of you here. I'd like to thank Fire personally for protecting my home, and I'm confident that I speak for most of you. I'd like to recognize law enforcement for protecting my home after I had to evacuate. I can't fathom the pain that people feel that have lost their homes. Um, I'm going to talk today about the health consequences, air quality. How do you know when you're, this is a really kind of an obvious question, but it's probably the thing to walk away with. How do you know when you're in a fire impacted poor air quality area? It's pretty simple. You smell smoke or you see ash falling or it's on the ground. Ash can be irritating to the skin, nose, and throat. It can cause coughing and rarely nosebleeds. Fine particles can be inhaled and enter your lungs and be injurious to people that have underlying lung conditions and heart conditions. Pregnant women, elderly, infants are the ones that are most susceptible from ash exposure. Don't allow children to play in the ash. Wash and clean off their toys if you suspect they were exposed to ash. And children should not be allowed to be in the vicinity of a cleanup of ash. Everyone should limit their amount of time outside and stay indoors as much as possible. And these comments are all directed towards when you're aware that the air uh, has um, smoke or ash in it. If possible, seek shelter in buildings with filtered air, or if you can, move to an area that is less impacted. Keep your windows and doors closed at home unless it's extremely hot outside. And if you don't have an air conditioner, 
find a place that does if you can. Run your home or car air conditioner and recirculate. And in fact, just all the time, even when there's not a fire, when you're driving down the street and you see a tractor raising a dust cloud, it's a good idea because of possible infectious diseases to just punch that button and get your car and recirculate. If you or your children have asthma or other lung or heart diseases, make sure you follow your doctor's advice about taking your medications. For those who cannot avoid being outdoors in a smoky environment, they should use a mask, also called a respirator, that is either an N95 mask or a P100 mask that'll help filter out particles. Um, they do not remove irritating chemicals that are contained in smoke, just the particles. Uh, small size respirators, they don't work well on children. So I wouldn't rely on them. Effectively, effective use of a respirator, a mask, relies on selecting a size and model that will provide a tight fit against your face. And you want to pinch that, that wire at the top. And you don't want the sensation of air coming in around the edges of the respirator. Those are the cup-like th structures that sit on your face. There are also masks that are rectangular, that have strings coming off of each corner. They're called surgical masks. Those do not really help very much in keeping you from inhaling stuff from outside. They're worn by people who we do not want to see infecting others. So they protect in the other direction. Um, I'm just going to mention that ash burned from structures is generally more hazardous than forest or wildfire ash. Forest ash contains microscopic particles of vegetable matter uh, that can be inhaled. But ash from buildings may contain chemicals such as lead, cadmium, nickel, and arsenic, asbestos from older structures, um, perfluorochemicals from non-stick cookware that's burned in fires, flame retardants, caustic materials, so if the ash contains asbestos, nickel, arsenic, cadmium, then exposure is of particular concern. Because the substances in the ash vary, it's always best to be cautious and avoid any unnecessary exposure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce Chris Stevens. Chris is the Director of the Resource Management Agency for the County of Ventura. He's going to talk a bit about debris removal and uh, the impacts associated with that. Chris. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a couple of points uh, for you related to the fire debris that's uh, uh, been left behind. Um, as we all know, in our homes, we have a lot of materials that, that, that fall under the category of household hazardous waste. Those are paints, solvents, pesticides, and such. Um, there's also a lot of materials used in the construction of our homes, be they plastics, metals, or asbestos. Um, after a fire, uh, those uh, become hazardous uh, materials, hazardous waste, perhaps, in uh, the fire debris. And we need to take extra caution uh, when we deal with that debris. And so uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that we know a lot of folks are going to be returning to their properties here uh, over the coming days. And, and we urge you to make sure that you uh, wear the respirators that uh, Dr. Levin just described. You wear gloves uh, and you wear protective clothing. A lot of you will be on those sites trying to see what you can recover uh, of your valuables. Um, this, the second uh, thing that I wanted to talk about uh, because of the hazardous nature of the debris is that its removal is going to take a little extra care. And uh, there is a process uh, that uh, will need to be followed before the debris can be removed from those sites. Um, very briefly, it's kind of a two-step process. Uh, initially, there will be an assessment of the site and those materials identified at that time as being hazardous or potentially hazardous will be removed. And then once that's done, uh, the remaining debris uh, will be removed and taken to uh, an appropriate landfill. 
the hazardous materials will be taken to a facility that's licensed to take that type of material. So it's a two-step process. Um, and uh, we are currently working, uh, the county, our environmental health division is working with the state to uh, see if we can coordinate use of a program that they offer that will conduct that step one work at no cost to the property owner and have uh, state uh, representatives from the Department of Toxic Substances Control come out and take care of that for you and, and remove that from your properties. Uh, and then we can move into the step two process um, and we'll be gathering information on that. Uh, we're trying to um, uh, make that as available as quickly as we can to the residents. Uh, last, late last night, we stood up a website, VenturaCountyRecovers.org. Uh, we've posted some information on there already related to the handling of the ash and the debris when you go back to your sites. We will be populating that with additional information uh, on all of the debris removal uh, information as, as it becomes available to us. Um, also, I think um, uh, Mark mentioned that uh, there'll be a local assistance center set up uh, here. The county is cooperating in that. Uh, there'll be a whole range of services uh, available at those centers. We'll also provide uh, updated information on debris removal uh, at those local assistance centers as well. Um, and I think, uh, I think with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Chris. Next, I'd like to introduce Terry Yanez. Terry is the Deputy Director of Behavioral Health for the County of Ventura and talk about some additional resources available through her agency. Terry. Hello, good afternoon. On behalf of the Behavioral Health Department, we want to express our sorrow. I'm sorry, our sorrow um, for our community. We're here to support the community in their needs. After a wildfire or another disaster or tragic events, people tend to feel stress, grief, guilt, and anger. And it's important for you to remember that there are ways to cope and you do not need to deal with the difficult times alone. We each have different needs and different ways to cope. So given that we have staff, um, we have teams out at all of the evacuation centers now. We have a team up at the temple to assist um, families with any questions. And we, in the um, cafeteria, we have a team ready to assist and provide materials to you today. I encourage you to Grab the materials, take them with you. You may not be feeling it now, but those, those feelings will occur or could occur at, at different stages. Um, I'm going to keep it short. We have a, a website, wellnesseveryday.org. Wellness you can go onto that website for additional resources. And again, on behalf of our department, the Behavioral Health and the Health Care Agency, um, we're here to support our community. Thank you. Hi, Steve Bennett, County Supervisor, back again. I want to thank Terry from Behavioral Health and all of the county representatives uh, that are here today uh, and also share with you um, one other uh, program effort that we're, we're making. Uh, we will, uh, on Tuesday, uh, the Board of Supervisors will we will have an agenda item, and it will be to try to help us um, with our low-income residents who are really going to struggle uh, in this situation. And so we will have an agenda item, and more information about it will be on the Ventura, Re Ventura County Recovery uh, org program that uh, Chris mentioned on that website. But it will be a rental assistance program for low-income people. If you know people or if you're in that situation or if you know people in that situation, uh, I encourage you after Tuesday to go look at that, see the details, uh, and see if we can help people uh, that are in that category. The other thing, just on a personal note, I would like to mention is we've already been contacted by a number of low-income people uh, who have been burned out, um, and they um, we're going, I just think that many of us are going to have to open up our homes. Uh, we have already done that, taken a second family in uh, to our home, and I would just encourage you to, if you know people that have 
extra room in their houses. Um, if you would contact my office, we will eventually set up an appropriate sort of clearing house for this. But if you'll contact my office and let us know of places where people would be willing to take uh, low-income families um, to help them get through this crisis, uh, we would really appreciate that. And again, I want to thank um, the city of Ventura very much. This was uh, uh, a, uh, a very important first step, uh, and for us to be able to coordinate so well between city and county, I think, is, is remarkable. So thank you very much, the city representative. But before we conclude, I want to let the public know two things. Uh, first, uh, the city council held an emergency meeting yesterday uh, for the purposes of getting this update, of ensuring that we're getting all the information possible out to the public. Uh, we've uh, entered into an emergency designation, which we'll be also uh, authorizing uh, on our, at our Monday council. And that brings us into the next thing, because I want to recognize and bring three individuals up to the stage. We have Congresswoman Julia Brownlee, uh, State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and Assemblywoman Monique Lamone. And, and while they're coming up, I, while, while they're coming up, I want, I want everyone to know that, that these three women are working around the clock. They've been here since Monday and they are tirelessly working at the state and the federal level to provide us all the resources we're going to need to fight this fire and to truly recover. And the public is in very, very good hands with these individuals. So we'll start with Congresswoman Julia Brown. Well, I'm delighted to be here with all of you and um, just uh, terribly, terribly sorry for the hardship uh, that everyone is going through. And um, I will say that the uh, one really positive thing that I have seen is the goodness of the community and people um, really uh, gathering around, want to help one another, and I've seen it in every corner of Ventura County, but I do want you to know that um, I'm on top of what the federal government needs to do. We've obviously got to get the fires out, but as we enter into the recovery stage, I will be working uh, very, very closely with FEMA and we'll get that information out to you um, on a very timely basis. If anyone uh, goes on my website, there's already information there with regards to recovery. Um, and also join my Facebook page. I'm updating uh, on my Facebook page uh, hour by hour. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. Uh, Venturans. Um, I'm State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. I represent uh, the entire area of this fire. Uh, I also happen to be the chair of the Joint Committee on Emergency Management, um, fortuitously. Uh, so, so I'm going to make sure you have a very loud voice in what we do uh, to help you all recover from this horrific event. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the, the firefighting that's been going on has been absolutely nothing short of heroic. Um, they have been extraordinary. Cal OES, Cal Fire, our county, city folks. And uh, we just came from touring the area with the governor, or the governor's here. We just came from an event with him. He has seen the devastation. He's very aware of this. Uh, from the state level, working with uh, Congresswoman Brownlee's office and the Congresswoman herself, we are going to do everything possible. One of the things we know, though, that now that the fire, hopefully, and this is real wood, so I can knock on real wood, uh, that we are not going to experience any further uh, fires in the city and in the surrounding areas. Uh, we don't know for sure because Mother Nature does not share her playbook with us. But to the extent that we are done with the actual immediacy of this fire, there is a lot of work to be done to get everybody back into their homes, to help people rebuild, 
their homes to be safe, which is the most important thing. Uh, we have a couple fires that just occurred a couple months ago up in the Santa Rosa area. We are working with those folks who are essentially two months ahead of us to make sure we can provide you with the information you need. That's really so important right now. We recognize that. We're going to do everything we can to keep you informed. The city's done a great job here pulling this together. I urge you to stay in touch. Anything you need, if something smells funny to you, there are some people out there that would like to take advantage of you. Make sure that you ask the people here in the city and throughout the county and the state what it is we can do to help you, what you need, because that is why we're here. So thank you all for being here today. We will win this fight. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Assemblymember Monique Limon. Buenas tardes. Um, I see colleagues also here from Santa Paula, so I want to recognize that um, we are an 805 community that is sticking together. Um, an 805 community. Uh, I, I also want to, you know, I want to thank the city. The city has been incredible. Mayor, council members, um, the city team, your police chief, your fire chief, I mean, everybody involved. And what you need to know is that in our roles, we are coordinating with them. Since Monday, we've been taking notes of you know places where we can do better, where the state can do better, where we'll work with our federal uh, legislator and make sure that the 805 has representation. On a regular basis, our office uh, serves you in ways to help you navigate state departments. This is not going to be the exception. Um, we know that you have questions related to insurance, housing, rebuilding. Um, all of those things are things that we do on a regular basis and we will continue to do, but know that they are elevated at a higher level by working with this incredible team that's behind you. Um, county supervisors, the whole, the whole, whole team um, is working together and we plan on uh, raising these issues. We've had the opportunity to meet with the governor and he immediately raise some issues related to what it will take to be able to rebuild this community um, and the entire community that's been affected. So on that part, just know that our offices are available to you, but also be rest assured that this team behind you um, is working together as fast as we can um, to try to better serve you in this disaster. We know it's a disaster. We've had the opportunity to tour multiple areas, Santa Paula, Ventura, um, and uh, as a member of the Housing Committee in the state of California, you need to know that uh, we will be having this conversation uh, right away in terms of what we do to support Californians um, in a disaster like this in order to build a pathway to rebuilding. So thank you. Thank you. I think it's, um, it is so symbolic to, uh, to end our meeting with that show of strength from all the various levels of government. I wanted you to know that the entire Ventura City Council is here. Uh, I've seen school board members here. Uh, I see council members from Santa Paula. I've seen Ojai folks here. Uh, our county CEO is here. Our supervisors are here. It's our job to make sure this is seamless. It doesn't matter to you who provides the service. It's our job to make that sure that service gets provided. And so I can tell you, we're all working together. We're working cooperatively. It's an incredible effort to get our city back and to get you all back in your homes. Um, in order to facilitate that, uh, we are going to transition to the cafeteria. Everybody who is on stage will be available here. We couldn't put everybody on stage. Let me give you an idea who we've got in the cafeteria, and that includes people from the county recorder's office, from the Red Cross, healthcare agency, the Unified School District, the county tax assessor, Southern California Gas, Southern California Edison, the other utilities. We tried to just bring as many people together as we could to provide you with the information that you know you're looking for. As I said before, we may not have all the answers. Let us know what those questions are, and we'll do the best to get answers to you. We thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we move through this and as we try to get everybody back into their homes. Uh, we're going to answer questions next door because we've got so many people here. We know we've had you for an hour. Is there, um, there is not. There are no target dates. We are still in an active fire. That fire is burning. It's burning above Fillmore. It's burning in Ojai. And it's burning knocking on Carpinteria. As the fire is put out, we will be full force into recovery. 
Right now, we are still in an active fire zone, which is why we still have mandatory evacuations and why we're trying to be so cautious and make sure that everybody is safe and we don't move anybody back in their neighborhood until it's safe. Um, and so with that, I'm going to thank you all. I thank all the responders that are here. Um, we will go forward.